Hello and welcome to TTELT, Teaching Tips for English Language Learners. I am Dr. Eileen Hale, the COO of our organization, and we have a wonderful special guest today with us, Beth Trudell, who's also a new board member. We're so excited to have her join our organization. This month of October, we are doing a series on experiential education and how to apply real life experiences for your classroom. So I'm gonna give a quick introduction about Beth and then she's going to talk to us about alternative assessments for kind of real life application of assessments, which is very important for all of us, I think. But first of all, I just wanted to say hello, Beth, welcome. Yeah. Thank you, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm really thrilled about this topic. And I have to tell you, we'll eventually get to outcomes, but we had great outcomes with our alternative assessment project. Wonderful. And Beth, uh, just to give a quick background for our listeners, began as an English language fellow working in Bangladesh and then worked as a senior fellow in Pakistan and Afghanistan. She designed the first MA in TESOL program, has quite a breadth of experience that we won't go all into now, but we again are thrilled to have her as a board member working with us at TTELT. So Beth, um, maybe you could just jump in. Again, our topic is alternative assessment for the writing classroom. Right. And tell us, what do you mean, first of all, by alternative assessment? I will, I will tell you that. Um, with alternative assessment, it is definitely doing assessments differently. We really decided as a team at Brack University in Bangladesh to radicalize our assessment problem program. And the reason we did this was because we had two great big problems. And the two problems were Number one, we weren't assessing what we taught. So at Brack University, one of the great things is that the students are placed in modules according to their English language abilities. So there are no mixed ability classrooms. I was working with a 101 module, which is the intermediate module. And we were teaching them process writing. So we expected that they would plan, they would do an outline, a spider diagram, they would do at least two drafts of their paper, and they would revise and edit, and we were teaching that, and they would peer review. I used to tell my students, put your paper to bed at night, let it rest, and then the next morning, take a look and see how it is then. Now, that's how we were teaching. But, and I was saying, I believe in process writing, but our, our assessment project did not reflect that. After, <coughs> excuse me, after teaching process writing, we would then for the midterm or final exam, we would throw them in a room and give them a prompt and expect them to write an essay in an hour, an hour and a half. There was no resting their essay. There was no reflecting on it. It really didn't match what we were doing. And we know we needed to do sec something about that. The second problem, <coughs> excuse me, was students were very fearful of the exams. They were very nervous. Um, no matter how many times I told them that they were so capable and so good, no matter how many times we reviewed the semester's program, they still were nervous about taking the exam. And it really broke my heart that our struggling students who had really improved so much did not do well on the exam because of that fear. And I decided we really needed to do something about this. So I did some research. Yes, that's a fantastic points to identify. And what did your research come up with? <laughs> how did you, this is how you came up with the alternative assessments for the writing classroom? Exactly, exactly. Um, so this first quote that you see on the screen is from, believe it or not, a, phys a physics professor at Harvard, a very famous guy. 
And I was reading some of his articles and he had completely stopped lecturing and gone to alternative, alternative assessments. And he said, assessment should mirror real life and be planned with a student's future in mind. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're, no, we're nowhere near that. Then I saw another source that said, when you're creating your assessment, don't think of where your students are now, think of where they're going to be five years from now. That's and really, thought, really well, important. Yeah. yeah, and I thought, well, if they're employed, <clears throat> they will be writing with lots of different people in employment. And if they're going to graduate school, they will be writing with a lot of other students. So we decided, here's our answer right here on this side. We decided to radicalize. And what's really important is humanize the project. You know, um, we wanted to get rid of this fear. We wanted it to be a real live learning experience. So this is what we did. So how did you radicalize and humanize? And, and let's think of uh, our listeners right now. I'm presuming this is mostly geared towards high school and college level students. Is that correct, Beth? Oh, I'm sure it is. Yes, yes. And so for those that have to do the conventional writing exams for their schools, um, mm -hmm. curriculum and those kind of things, is it possible to radicalize and humanize your writing assessments even within those constraints yes. and or do the traditional and do this? It is, it is. I'll tell you, um, even at the university, some of the higher ups were not too crazy about this idea, just as the college and the um, high school students, teachers or high school teachers, their higher ups would be. And you can take a few of these points. I'm gonna talk about each one, but maybe you could start with one of them. And so, for example, we did multiple day assessments. Rather than doing something in an hour, an hour and a half, the midterm was two days. And you won't believe this, but the final exam was six days. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know, it is unbelievable, but it really worked. The students work in groups. Now, I'm sure our secondary school teachers and our college teachers could get their students working in groups on the exam. For example, um, maybe you don't want to radicalize this much. One teacher I know had the students take the final exam in a group. First, they had them take it individually and then in a group. And then they compared how they did and what the experience was like. And that was kind of a fun way to radicalize it. Now we did have students working in groups and I think that's really important because I'm gonna tell you, um, I'm gonna go off, offline here a little bit and tell you about this study that was done at the University of Michigan, which is a very good university in the US. They studied all the research on how students learn best. I mean, this was a gigantic project they did. And what they discovered is that students learn best when they learn from other students. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really important point and it someday could put yeah. us on the job, but it's an important point. That's extremely important. I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah. I, you know, you think about, you just take a test, you work just for a grade normally, right? And just to pass yeah. the class or get your passing grade. But if you retake a test with a group, then you even learn that much more, right? Because then you're really doing it for the purpose of learning, not for the purpose of getting a specific grade or just passing the class. And that's exactly. what it, right? it's, it's, a, it's also almost an enjoyable activity with their peers. Right. So students working in groups, I mean, if you're gonna start somewhere to radicalize, I would start with students working in groups. Another important point is integrating reading and writing. So think about this. Usually we take a prompt, we throw it at our students and say, write something about this prompt. And you look at your students and they're sitting there not doing anything because they're trying to think of ideas. And at the end of the class, they go, we couldn't think of any ideas, you know? Well, it's because it's a prompt. If we have them read something and in our final exam, they read more than just one piece. It gives them a knowledge foundation and they have ideas to, read, to write about. 
And William Grabe, who's a really wonderful guy on reading, he's a, a great expert. He really recommends integrating reading and writing and giving them a reading guide. And that was one of the sample tools we gave our student was a reading guide. And it really worked well. That's fantastic. And you just made me think about the idea of what if students had to give prompts to each other? Right. Um, student driven, right. right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And right, think of some prompts, exactly. So we had a lot of interactive activities because as we know, that really triples the learning. As I mentioned, sample tools, reading guide, a sample outline, you know, give them, give them support and help to make it a learning experience. So um, if you want, I can quickly go over the six days just for an example of what they did. Sure, that would be great. Good, good. So first of all, on day one, and this was, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, in 101, we were doing summaries and response essays. So the summary was the midterm, and then the summary and response was the final exam. So first day, we placed it to students in small groups. You can't do groups of six, seven, eight, because that's when students get lost in the group. So small groups, we gave them an article on the topic and um, we gave them an article and they read and they annotated the article. And then for homework, they went home and they searched for more articles on the topic. So they got a little research in here. Um, and then they came back to the class and they brought the article. On day two, the group members looked at the articles and decided which ones to use. And then using a sample outline, they outlined their response paper, okay? And using a checklist, they peer reviewed it with other groups. So checklist, and they created the checklist. This is really important to have them doing as much work as possible. On day three, they wrote the first draft. Now, this could be that what some of the students did is each person in the group took a piece of the essay and wrote it, and then they worked on it together. On the more difficult parts, perhaps the thesis statement, two people would work on it, but they decided how they were going to do this and how to divide up the work. Um, they're, they're adults, and even if you have high school students, the more decisions they make, the better decision makers they will be as adults. So let them make some decisions. And then on day four, they continued to write the first draft and using a rubric, one of my most favorite tools. And you can use rubrics, high school, college, university, grade school. The students continue to write the first draft and they create a peer review checklist using the rubric. Then they peer review the first draft and they create a revision checklist. This sounds like a lot of work, but when you have a group doing it, it gets done very easily. If one person were doing this work, it would be overwhelming. Um, the teacher don't have to create the rubric, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then on day six, they revise their first draft using the revision checklist and other documents. And that was the end of it. Then they handed it into the teacher. And the groups, the group collaboration was amazing, amazing. And like I said, it went well. That's fantastic. So can you jump into, sorry, one second, the outcomes for us? I would love uh, to jump into the outcomes. Um, great. It's a lively classroom. I. I observed and taught so many of these classes. The classroom is amazing. After they did the first prayer review, they all went back to their tables to work with their own group on revising and doing things like that. And then all of a sudden I saw two students jump up and go back to the group that peer reviewed and ask them questions. You know, a very smart thing to do. Let's make sure they understand. Or I saw students nicely arguing with the people who did their peer review and they had to defend their work. And it was really fun watching them jump up and go to another group or go, go to another group for help. Maybe they knew st a student who was an expert in some other. So they had a lot of freedom and they really used it. 
So that was fun. No more struggling alone. No more watching your students during a final exam, looking around, trying to think of ideas. It, I mean, the class was bursting with energy. Mm -hmm. That was That's another what we all want, right? <laughs> yes. And assessments promote success. You know, usually assessments are like, I passed it, I failed it. This very, everybody was successful. They were very successful. That's fantastic. And really That's what you want in life, right? <laughs> For them to feel yeah. that success. And as a matter of fact, I have, if you'd like to hear, I have a few feedback points. I looked at these the other night and ever, all the students, all the feedback said they loved the group work and they learned so much in the groups. My favorite comment was one student said, I learned that I have to come to class to learn. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, at this late date, they're learning this. And, um, and students said, no stress, no fear. I can use this in the future. Many of them actually recognized that this was a useful tool for their academic classes and in the future. So a lot of success. I do say the difficulties they had were finding the articles and it, it helped us realize that we needed to do some teaching on how to search and how to, knew, how to know if on the internet um, there's good material or this was a reliable. So there's so life people. learning experiences, right? Yeah, exactly. But they were learning. They were learning what they could do well and what they needed to improve. And I wasn't telling them. They were discovering it for themselves. And the students really learned. And so many of them said, many, many, they had a good time while learning and they made a lot of new friends, which was fun too. People they could go to with their writing problems. And teachers love the process after it was over. I have to say, we have, we have a lot of um, students in 101, so we have a lot of teachers in that module. And the teachers were all willing to try it. They knew that we needed to do something new. The majority of, it, of them really liked the process. And there was a group <clears> of <throat> five of them that worked with me on the process. But there were some who were not sure. At the end, they were all sure. So that was great. That's fantastic. And I think one of you know, the biggest takeaways is, again, our topic for this month on experiential education is the real life application of knowledge, mm -hmm. particularly for our English language learners. We want them to be confident to use English outside the classroom and providing assessments <laughs> that utilize their English language skills. We've already done a podcast this month uh, with Peter Edwards on oral presentations and doing those with strangers and how important that is. And now Beth's uh, alternative assessment with writing. You could dovetail these together for both writing in the real world and speaking in the real world for some concrete activities related to experiential education and using them in the real world. Exactly. And we know how difficult writing is for second language learners and whatever we can do to make it, especially make these exams a learning experience and to make it a positive experience. We need to do this. Um, so I think that's important. And again, I would say to our secondary school teachers and college teachers and, our, and our, even our grade school teachers, to start with one point, you don't have to radicalize the whole thing. We were lucky we were able to do that. We really had a push to do it, but we did it. But start by having maybe giving your students a quiz in a group or having your students create questions for the quiz and then doing it in a group. Um, and then moving on to instead of giving them prompts for writing, Give them something to read for writing. Even grade school children, if you read them a story or if they read a story and then they write about it, they have ideas to write about. It's a, it's a really important factor. And I do have to say, I, I read an interesting article also um, about a teacher in a very poor area of one of the US states and her students had very little life experience. They were trying to get their equivalency, their high school equivalency, 
And she had them read all different um, authors from conservative to radical. And then they started forming their own ideas. Um, reading really does a lot. So that's why I added, add, added it as a teaching tip. So here's the teaching tips. Coach students on how to work effectively in groups. You know, our students were 18 to 20 years old, university students, and many of them were from very traditional high schools and they had never had to work in groups. So that coaching on how to do this is important. And in one um, segment, one class, what we did is we had them strategize in groups on how to get everybody involved in working. How do you do that? And again, I was reviewing these the other day and one student said, okay, how I would get these lazy students, a little judgmental, but they had the idea, you know? Um, so you need to coach students ahead of time. And that strategizing really helped. The students really thought that was helpful. I For the reading Sorry to interrupt you. I was yeah. just going to add, I found it helpful to assign roles when you put your students oh. in groups so that everybody knows what they're supposed to do and have a certain responsibility within the group so that they are really encouraged to actively participate within the role that they're given. And then you can switch the roles. Uh, one could be the reporter, one could be the speaker sharing back, those kind of things. Yes, and that's a very good point. And we had our groups, they decided on their roles, you know, and who was going to write what and who was going to do this and two people working on a checklist, two people doing this. They, they did a good job of that. It's amazing um, when, it, when it's a final exam, they really came to life. It was amazing. And, and again, this may seem obvious, but for the reading segment, a topic and articles that are interesting to all the students. I see students reading articles that are not gen gender neutral. They might be interesting to the males in the class, but maybe not the females or vice versa. And reading articles that affect their lives. Like we gave them an, um, a topic one time on that the grading, if the grading system should be abolished and what would be the outcome of that. And they had to think critically about this, but it was something that really affected them and they were really into doing that. Yeah, and that applies to real life too. Again, the topic of our month is the importance of having topics that not only are relevant to them and interesting to them, but will apply to their future and things they'll have to consider in their future lives outside of the classroom. Yeah, I was so glad I read those two articles um, about the future, thinking of their future. It really changed how we did things. And also rubrics are an important tool to help students understand the expectations for an excellent essay. You know, again, as you grade them, it makes your life so much easier when they've been working from a rubric and you are working for a rubric. And the rubric really helped the students to create the revision and, and peer review checklist. So that was very important. And that reminds me of something I forgot to say about the teachers. The teachers were especially happy because they didn't have as many final exam papers to grade because the papers were from the groups and it was one paper per group. And I wanna add one grade per group. So that's why it was important for them to know how to work effectively in the groups and get everybody working. So yeah, the teachers love that. And then I can't say this enough, integrate reading and writing. I think it's so important. You know, we all come from backgrounds, I think, where we isolated, you know, you learned how to teach reading, you learned how to teach writing and you learned how to teach listening. But the more you can integrate the skills, the better off your students are because that's real life. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Beth. These are wonderful tips for our listeners. Um, the only last question I have for you is what do you do if uh, one person in the group does the majority of the work? How do you make sure that everybody equally contributes when you're having a group grade for the group assessment projects? And that's a very good question because we've all had that experience or one person tries to dominate. Uh -huh. the group and get them to do everything his or her way. Now, that's exactly why we did the coaching on how to work in a group. And I had a little worksheet. I had a worksheet on, on and first of all, 
It was the different things about involving people. And, and they came up with words to use. And then on the back of the paper were my suggestions also for words to use. So they had a worksheet to fill out in their group that they were, these were just groups in the regular classroom of how to talk to people about it. You know, they're 18, they don't know how to talk to people about these things. They've never had to be a little confrontational about getting the work done. And if everybody doesn't work, everybody doesn't get a great grade. And the teacher, I mean, I was not coaching the groups verbally because it is an exam, it's still an exam. So as I usually work with groups, I didn't do that. And none of the teachers did that. But the teachers were walking around making notes and perhaps giving feedback to a group um, in general or giving feedback to the class in general. But again, nothing will replace. Also, how to accept feedback, coaching them on how do you accept feedback? You know, people get defensive, how to give feedback, how to accept it, how to work with your group. So we did a lot of pre-work on that. And those are really life skills. So we really didn't mind taking the time to do that. I mean, those are good. I would start teaching that in grade school, you know, if I could. Um, yeah. It's important to have that life skill of how to give feedback. I mean, think about a marriage, you know, I mean, think about siblings. It's yeah. important to do that. And for your workplace outside of the classroom as well, obviously, you got to take feedback and give feedback. Exactly. Sure. Right. So thank you so much, Beth. This has been really valuable for our listeners, I think, on alternative assessments. And we hope that you will be able to share a live workshop with us in the future. Oh, for but sure. And, and also, I'm going to involve one of my colleagues from Bangladesh. He is really eager to do it. And I think it will be really interesting from the teacher standpoint who actually did the work semester after semester after semester. And I want to tell everybody, I don't know if you saw it on the first slide, but my email address is my last name. Trudell, T-R-U-D-E-L-L, six zero at AOL.com. And if you have any questions um, at all about this process or anything I said, or if you want to disagree with me, send me an email. I'm really happy to respond to your emails. Thanks so much, Beth. And we'll put your email in the notes for our listeners. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you again for your time today. I just wanted to share um, an announcement for the end of this month, uh, last Saturday of every month. It'll be Saturday, October 30th at 12 noon or 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have our TTELT Talks. This is a time where you get to share ideas and concerns, the questions that matter most to you as teachers. So please email us with your ideas, tteltinfo at gmail.com. And we'd love to include you as both a participant and a, a person that brings ideas to the table for our future workshops and topics that are most pertinent to your reality right now. And I, I just have to say, I've taken part um, in one of these and it was really a lot of fun. And um, and I'm going to continue to take part of them because I just I really enjoy hearing the teachers' ideas and, and talking about questions they have. Thank you, Beth. We are so grateful for you participating with us today. Please follow us um, on our Facebook group, Instagram, and Twitter. All of these accounts you can see on our website at ttelt.org. You can also register for workshops and all of our events on our website page under events, as well as listen to prior podcasts and see them on our YouTube channel, our TTELT under YouTube channels. Thanks so much, Beth. We are grateful for your time today and look forward to seeing you in the future live workshop. Good. And when we do the live workshop, I'll be sharing some of the, uh, we'll be sharing the documents with you. Wonderful. So we'll keep you posted. Stay tuned. Thanks, Thank Beth. You. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. You too, and all of you out there, thank you. Bye.